Kia ora, good morning. Uh, it's a real privilege to be speaking today on the disproportionate impacts of climate change on children and rele relevant policy solutions for the expert dialogue. This is a really important topic, and I'm speaking both as an author and a coordinating lead author for the IPCC's AR6 cycle of reports, and also as a researcher that works on issues of child for children and sustainable development. So the first thing that I'd like to highlight is that the IPCC has had an increasing focus on issues for children and youth in climate change, but that focus has dissipated across our reports. The report that has the greatest reference uh, to children and young people is our adaption um, report from impacts and adaptation in 2022, where there's over 400 references. But those references are often um, across many regions and across many topics. So I'd like to highlight some of the key issues. And in a way, the title um, and cover itself reflects this issue because the artist's um, image that adorns this report is by um, Elisa Singer, and she calls it Borrowed Planet, inherited from our ancestors on loan from our children. And there are many issues within the report that I'd like to highlight here. But I'd also like in particular to highlight the most recent IPCC report, the synthesis report in 2023, where there are only 14 references to children and young people throughout the report, but they are crucial and they reflect a growing concern that we need to take urgent and effective and equitable action in mitigation and adaptation in order to promote um, the livelihoods, health, well-being and fairness for current and future generations. So turning first to that report, one of the most popular figures from that report has been the SPM figure one in section seven, which has included a baby for the first time. And it asks us to think about the extent to which current and future generations will experience a hotter and different, more dangerous world, depending on the choices we make now and in the near term. This particular diagram reinforces a study and uh, frequently asked questions that were raised in our uh, second adaptation report, where we highlighted the fact that children aged 10 or younger in 2020 will experience nearly a fourfold increase in extreme events in their lifetime under a scenario of 1.5 degrees of global warming by 2100, or a fivefold increase under three degrees of warming. Such increases in exposure won't be experienced by any person my age, aged 55 or over, in the year 2020 and in our remaining lifetime under any warming scenario. So thinking about the intergenerational and the direct consequences on children is significant. We often talk about the near-term action being by 2040 and the uh, long-term by 2100. But already for a child that's born in 2020, they'll only be 20 by 2040, and they'll only be 80 if they live a full life by the end of the century. So this is now talking about the effects that we are going to see within one human lifetime. So what are some of these effects? Well, within Working Group 2, there were significant references to children and young people in the context of health, and also thinking about the way in which children are not many adults, as many advocates for children remind us. They have particular physiological and development needs and that make them highly vulnerable to exposure to changing climate, both even um, prenatal, we see that children and pregnant women have potentially higher rates of vulnerability or exposure to climate hazards, extreme weather events, and undernutrition. Working Group 7 also highlighted available evidence that suggests that heat is associated with higher rates of preterm birth, low birth weight, stillbirth, neonatal stress, and adverse child health. The Africa chapter, where over 40% of the population is under the age of 15, has really emphasised exposure to high temperatures during pregnancy as being linked with adverse birth outcomes, including the stillbirths and miscarriages and long-term behavioural and development deficiencies. 
Still with health, chapter seven talks about increasing diet-related risk factors and related non-communicable diseases globally. The issues of undernutrition impacting stunting and related childhood mortality, particularly in Asia and Africa, depending on the mitigation and adaptation decisions and actions we take. Climate change is expected to have adverse impacts on well-being and to further threaten our mental health. There's very high confidence in this report that children and adolescents, particularly girls along with the elderly, are at risk. And that's both at risk from heat exposure and from issues of trauma and from the disruption of heat events on lifestyles and homes. Extreme weather events are associated too with um, reduced access to vital prenatal care unattended deliveries and to decreased pediatric health care access. Turning from health to issues around education and climate, these are distributed throughout the reports where we're seeing an impact of extreme weather events, including hurricanes, heat stresses examined in relation to education, even the effect of the loss of permafrost disrupting Indigenous children in, um, in the Yukon's access to study, and heat exposure to men, for many children in many places, affecting their opportunities for play. So this relationship between education and climate is noted at regional and in sectoral chapters, particularly in the context of children's lives, where they live in informal settlements, in Indigenous communities, or in marginalised and socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. The two girls that we see in this picture were students who spoke at the 1.5 um, special meeting in Botswana back in 2018 from Ramotswa School. And they just happened to mention that their school is affected by water shortages. And when water supplies to their school are reduced, they have to end their school day early. And that's meant a loss of several weeks of school. And that's compounded by the effect of flooding, which has um, affected transport routes to the school. These kind of experiences are magnified around the world and thinking about the way in which climate disrupts children's ability to flourish um, and to study is important. We also know, and the report has emphasized, that climate has cascading and compounding risks impacting people and the planet. Some of those risks are really magnified in hotspots of high vulnerability to climate change, particularly in Africa, Asia, in um, South and Latin America, and in the small island states and the Arctic. I want to just highlight one element of a figure in the synthesis report, which looks at the effect of extreme heat and drought, particularly on maternal malnutrition and children's um, undernutrition. There are other issues to think about too, particularly where children live in cities. We know that the impacts of climate change are magnified in cities where more than half the world's population lives. But this is particularly significant for our young people and children. By 2050, almost 70% of world's children will live in urban areas, and many of them will be living in informal settlements. Children and future generations are more likely to be exposed and vulnerable to climate change, to the risks of flooding, heat stress, coastal inundation, water scarcity, poverty, and hunger as they're experienced in urban areas. But urban areas are also a site for solutions because as Working Group 3 reminds us, the urban share of greenhouse gas emissions has increased from 2015, where it was about 62%, to between 67 and 72% of world emissions. And that matters because children living in cities, their lifestyles, their choices, their actions into the future will really affect our, our rates of emissions. And there are options we can take to reduce the risks to people and nature, and particularly to our children. So I'd just like to highlight some of the actions that are underscored in this report and some that we've noticed in our own research. So one of the actions is actually developing adaptation plans. And we see around the world that we are adapting uh, and planning for adaptation. But that progress is uneven. It's not happening fast enough. 
We know that there are increasing gaps between adaptation and action that's needed and what's actually taken on the ground. And those gaps are affecting low-income populations and young people, and they are expected to grow. Young people are asking for system change. So what does that system change look like? Well, in the IPCC reports, in the synthesis report in particular, we highlighted the way that young people in their mass social movements have emerged as a catalyzing agent alongside indigenous people, human rights movements, the gender activist groups, and climate litigation, calling for change, raising awareness, and in some cases, influencing the outcome and the ambition of climate governance. We're also seeing growing recognition that when you engage with children and young people, encourage their voice and listen to that voice, then we see effective outcomes. Effective and equitable climate governance builds on engagement with civil society, including youth. There's also recognition throughout the reports and in the synthesis report itself that youth, when they're engaged, can help influence political support for difficult choices like climate change mitigation. They can also, when they're engaged, help um, result in effective municipal and national decision making around adaptation. And we're also seeing a growing uh, rate of climate litigation. Large numbers of cases, many involving children as complainants, have been recorded in developing countries, a much smaller number in, in developing countries. But again, there's medium confidence and evidence that this is starting to actually um, influence government decision making. There are a range of other actions that are highlighted in the report, some around food and water. Again, inclusive governance involving marginalised groups, particularly young people and women, where we see gendered effects of climate change, particularly for girls, having a maternal and child health focus and having policies and practices around water and sanitation that reflect gender inequality, that understand climate services and social protection mechanisms are really important. AR6 was also significant for emphasising climate resilient development, that is integrating our actions for mitigation and our actions for adaptation, and drawing on diverse knowledge to do that, including partnerships with youth and women, Indigenous people and local communities and ethnic minorities. And where we see those partnerships, there's emerging research that tells us that the outcomes are more likely to be locally appropriate and socially acceptable. Finally, I'd just like to highlight some of the ways that we can see embedded environmental education in ways that actually help facilitate children and their communities' ambitions and lives. So what we have learned in our own research, stepping away from the IPCC for a moment and thinking about research that I've worked with, um, both with the University of Surrey in the UK under the Centre for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity in my own university at Canterbury, and our partners across seven diverse cities, is that for many children and young people, cities are a place in which we can see significant achievements can be made in terms of improving not only the low carbon lifestyles of children, but their well-being and their range of choices, their opportunities ranging from education right through to um, access to health services and water services. For many Indigenous communities, and here I'm thinking about work with the Deep South and National Ch Ch um, Science Challenge, we're seeing that when we're working with children from the Pacific who've been exposed uh, displaced or who have been part of the diaspora that have moved to New Zealand in particular, their communities are often exposed to coastal flooding and this has compounded the, the cultural disruption that's, that happens with climate change and the natural networks of leadership. And so actually thinking about ways in which we can support children and young people to recover and flourish with their cultural informed leadership, working alongside their communities to achieve the aspirations of their communities, we can see very significant um, beneficial effects. 
So I thank you for focusing on children and young people in this session. It's a very important dialogue. And as uh, Naitahu, who is the tribal authority for where I live in here in the South Island of New Zealand, says in a whakatoki or saying, Motato e mokauri amuri akene. These are decisions that matter for us and our children after us. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak.